revolution in 1724 that you will, you will not then launch a major debate with your fellow leader, as it were, as to exactly how things should be run. Anyway, so the point I'm making is that his conception of the party was not identical to that of Lenin, and he played down exactly what it was. He didn't actually formulate it fully. And so far as he did formulate it later in exile, in my view, it was very limited, and I personally suffered wouldn't really know exactly how one would go further with that. That, of course, links up with the um, question of uh, his particular role in supporting the revolution in 1917, and then later in his struggle against socialism in one country. Now, obviously, any Marxist must take the view that socialism in one country is a, a a nonsense is one of the reasons why the Stalinist cannot be a Marxist. However, if the question is exactly whether a party can take power in a, in, in a manner which is not democratic or wholly undemocratic. This is, of course, what happened in 1917. <coughs> People have defended taking of power in November 1917, October 1917. Um, by saying in some sense it was a democratic takeover. Well, it clearly wasn't. The majority of the country were peasants, and the majority of the peasantry did not support it. And that was clear. It became even clearer when the Constitutional Assembly <laughs> met in January 1918, where the Bolsheviks only had 14%, I think, of the delegates, and they then dissolved it. That's absolutely true. The, <clears throat> among the workers, again, Lenin actually wanted to take power, ignoring the Soviet. Trotsky did. Trotsky refused to go along with it, and they <clears throat> waited until the Soviet met, and uh, they got a majority in it, and then took power. Now, <clears throat> the question is how one looks at this whole process, because at no point can you actually say there was a. a, a fully or wholly or even a democratic process going on. It's very hard to argue. Um, part of what I said, but it goes further than that. Because people who have argued that um, Trotsky and Lenin were wrong <coughs> argued they should have remained wholly within the Soviets and waited to see what the Soviets would actually do. And then, of course, after having taken power, the Soviets were gradually ignored and e effectively put on one side. Workers' committees were ignored or not used and didn't have that much influence. That's absolutely true, but that is obviously what did happen. Well, the question is how one actually looks at that. In the first instance, it's not quite so simple. One can't just say um, workers' committees were democratic. Well, they weren't, in fact. They, they weren't the kind of elections that we, that, we, that we have today. But that doesn't mean to say they have no importance. But in the conditions of the time, it was very hard to conduct the kind of election we, we have today. In other words, they were influenced by a series of different factors, and people could be elected on God knows what ground. It, what, I'm not arguing that they should have been ignored. I'm simply pointing out, if one's looking at it in purely democratic terms, you couldn't say that they were necessarily representative of the working class as, as a whole. The second point, which goes along with that, and then uh, make the level point in relation to the question of taking power, <coughs> is that in the condition, uh, conditions of the time, the question is exactly what one would have wanted to do. It, it is, of course, an axiom of Marxism that one is talking of the self-emancipation of the proletariat. Well, how? How does the proletariat take power? Does it simply take power without any understanding beyond that? That to me is a mystical concept. There has to be a form by which it takes power, there has to, and there has to be a party which has to call parties. So that's one part. The parties which are actually leading it. If that doesn't happen, it will not happen at all. If there's no party leading it, nothing will happen. And we know that is the case. Because you can just look at the last hundred years. How many times has a proletariat not risen and been defeated? 
or disintegrate. How many times have there not been Soviets of different kinds, workers' councils, which went nowhere? And you can think of just think of a few recent examples in South America, in Albania, where you virtually had Soviets and nothing happened. The West just came in and took, took it over. There has to be a leadership. There has to be a party leadership. In principle, I mean, if we're talking of today, in my view, it has to be wholly democratic. At the time, that kind of democracy would have been very unlikely. Partly because of the disintegration, the whole disintegration process, the difficulty, uh, um, difficulties of organization at the time, and partly because that kind of democracy didn't exist anywhere at any point. Remember, in Britain, <coughs> The form of democracy we have today only, only comes to being in 928 when all females get the vote. And remember, when the revolution took place in 1917, the majority of people in Britain didn't have the vote. In Germany, the parliament was still subordinated to the Kaiser. In the United States, actually, women did not have the vote. So you, you're talking of a situation the kind of democratic form which now <laughs> did not exist there. You're also talking of a, a, a situation of war. <coughs> when millions were being killed, if you remember, everybody does remember. I think it was that context. Trotsky explicitly in his book, Terrorism and Communism, raises that issue, this issue we're just talking about, and says, well, if we'd had the time, we would have let the Constitu Constituent Assembly <coughs> go on, because of course they dissolved. We would have let it go on, we would have let it govern, and it would then have exposed itself, and we could have gone from there. But we didn't have the time. He's partly speaking of the war, the need to end the war, and he's partly talking <coughs> of the fact that the Russian Empire was in dissolution, the bourgeoisie itself was greatly weakened, it was possible to take power. And therefore, they thought they ought to take power. Which raised a more general question. If the proletariat is going to take power, will the bourgeoisie go to the moon, or will it not try and maintain itself? Obviously, it will maintain itself. You cannot take power when the bourgeoisie is itself strong, unless you have an equal strength on the other side. So, it, the, in other words, at that point, you are talking about needing to take the advantage of the weakness of the bourgeoisie and your own strength. I think it was in that kind of context that you're talking of taking a power in this particular way, which as I said, obviously wasn't a democratic form. Having done so, and then having won the war, they in fact had lost inter internationally. And there was no hope after that, unless there was a, a revolution. Hell, hell, could you finish up shortly in the okay. next minute. So. Okay. Okay, well the uh, <clears throat> final point is Trotsky of course then refused to take power by himself, which he could easily have done as the head of the Red Army and, and, and of course uh, with, with many spectators.